And so if you've got a question about that or any of our other stories or anything really, as long as it's at least remotely health related, you can email us, healthreport at abc.net.au, like Paul has. Are you ready for some questions, Norman? I'm ready. Paul is 63 and has had Graves' disease since the age of 45, which is a thyroid disease. My question is, has the treatment, well, Paul's question is, has the treatment of Graves' disease improved since his initial diagnosis 20-something years ago? And is his current method of treatment potentially a problem into old age? He's on some uh, antithyroid drugs. So Graves' disease is called thyrotoxicosis. So it's an overactive thyroid gland, usually as a result of an immune problem. And it's Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, basically the treatment hasn't changed very much. There's various treatments for it. You can take radioactive iodine to get rid of the thyroid, part of the thyroid gland or part of the thyroid gland. You can have surgery for it um, and you can have these antithyroid drugs. And it really hasn't changed that much. Um, there are some different drugs they use nowadays, but it's essentially the same treatment as, as, as always. Um, I Really, I'm not prepared to comment on just whether or not um, Paul's current treatment is going to create a problem later into life. We've really got to talk through that with, with your um, endocrinologist. Um, but you know, once it's treated, people do extremely well, um, but it's not something you want to leave. And the, the, side of the symptoms of, there are a lot of different symptoms of uh, a hyperactive thyroid. So shake, tremor, feeling agitated. Your eyes can enlarge. Uh, it's called exothalmia, and that can be difficult to treat. Um, and there are various other symptoms as well. And the good news is that usually thyrotoxicosis, essentially an overactive thyroid, is usually picked up sooner than an underactive thyroid. An underactive thyroid is probably something that is underdiagnosed in Australia, but symptoms of an overactive thyroid are usually pretty dramatic and can be picked up fairly early. As someone with an underactive thyroid, they look similar on ultrasound sometimes. So diagnosing um, both of them can be a bit complicated, but obviously people who know what they're doing know how to diagnose them. Yeah, and uh, Paul is saying that his thyroid function has been stable now for some years, and that's a good place to be. So from the throat to the bowel, uh, Richard is asking about bowel cancer screening. Uh, we've talked before about how it's available for people up to age 74, Richard's approaching that age and is wondering why this program finishes then. It's a very good question because people are going to live for another 20, sometimes you know, 25 years beyond age 74 and their risk of colon cancer will continue to rise after that. Um, it's just that the clinical trials are only done up to that age and therefore the evidence for benefit is only up to that age. You That's so interesting because we were talking last week, Norman, about clinical trials and women's health and that we're kind of constrained by the evidence that we have before us and the people who do trials have their reasons for choosing what they do, but it affects people's health. It does. And the cl these clinical trials into screening take a long time to perform. And when they were originally designed, life expectancy was very different. So at 74, you probably had a more limited life expectancy than you do now. And that's, uh, you, and that's a problem. But you can choose to be screened yourself. I mean, you can just go and have a fecal occult blood. You can buy it at the chemist. Various other organisations will sell you one. And I think most people in the area would say that you should continue to do it, even though the government might not sponsor you to do it for, for free. And here, you're, you're not talking about very much money to do your own fecal occult blood. Um, and that's fairly straightforward and it does, it's not going to break the bank. It's not as if you're going to have to have an expensive colonoscopy. And if you do have a positive fecal occult blood, your, medi your health insurance or Medicare will pay for the colonoscopy to be done. Should Australia change its policy around this? It's going to be difficult for the government to change its policy. It took forever to get the government to change its policy to actually follow the guidelines and actually have everyone screened from the age of 50 fully. And that's only relatively recently. So I don't think they're going to extend it beyond 74. But if you're going to live another 20 odd years and get colon cancer and need um, extensive surgery or, or expensive chemotherapy that's also going to be de deleterious to your health, um, there's a lot of benefit from diagnosing earlier. This is a curative disease. Okay, that's good to know. Now, a question from Neela, who her question is inspired by an episode of NCIS. She says she doesn't usually take her medical advice from TV crime dramas, but there was a medical examiner on the show that said nail pitting can be a sign of psoriasis or inflammatory arthritis. She had that uh, and she had rheumatoid arthritis. Do we have any insight into what causes this and why it may show up before more other obvious symptoms of a disorder like rheumatoid arthritis? Well, I'm not sure it shows up before, but 
So, so this actually raises a really interesting story around the nails. The nails are a really interesting place to diagnose various diseases. So, for example, you can diagnose chronic lung disease from the tips of your fingers and around your nails because in some people with chronic lung disease, the tip of the fingers um, is called clubbing. The tip of the fingers expands and the, you, you, the clubbing is what it says it is. You, they, they, they just look a bit clumsy and so on. It's not so much the nails. You can have a serious illness and get over it and then some weeks or months later, your nails show a ridge from that, um, from that period of serious illness. You can get weak um, nails that are easily broken, maybe a sign of anemia. And yes, autoimmune disease can cause problems in the nails as well. And obviously you can get fungal diseases in the nails. So the nails are an important thing to look at when you're diagnosing disease. And nobody's absolutely sure, but it probably is the growth plate in your, uh, of your nails can be disrupted by serious illness, and um, and the, the and essentially the there's disruption of the growth of the nail because your body's busy doing other stuff and not concentrating on growing the nails. That's very simplistic, but that's probably what's going on. I'm not sure it's absolutely known. Oh my gosh! So nails are like canaries in the coal mines. I wonder if I should stop. My nails at the moment are sparkly blue. I could be hiding all sorts of diseases, Norman. Uh, it's best not to know. <laughs> now I think you've got a question for me today. Yeah. I gather, this is from Andrew, I gather COVID-19 is an example of a zoonosis, in other words, a disease that spreads to humans from animals. I was wondering how new variants may come about through reverse zoonosis. Well, I suppose it still is zoonosis. In other words, going from human animals to animal animals. What's the chance of that happening? Well, yeah, I mean, it's no less likely, I suppose, than it is to go from an animal to a human, although I suppose we're accepting uh, pathogens from all of the animals and animals are only accepting pathogens from one species, that is humans. But yes, it does happen. It's happened before. And it doesn't just happen with viruses either. It can happen with parasites, bacteria, fungal infections, and it can work in our favour sometimes. So, for example, ferrets can catch COVID-19, and that has been useful for us because we can use them then as a as a model animal to study our vaccines and our treatments but it is it is a big risk and one of the big um, things that shone a spotlight on this was the h1n1 pandemic the swine flu pandemic in the 2000s because the swine flu came from pigs but it was also possible for humans to transmit back into pigs and for the same reasons that we've been worried about zoonoses coming into humans and the, the sort of things that our our society has, is doing in modern times, like living in closer proximity with lots of animals, global animal trade, global human uh, travel, and um, impacting habitat destruction and basically encroaching on wild animals' habitats. These are all things that increase the chances of humans catching diseases from other animals. But similarly, we could, we could give them back to animals again. At the moment, I, I don't know of any situation where we've caused a pandemic in animals that has then threatened us again. But uh, it's one of these things that uh, global health organisations, including the World Health Organisation, has keep, is keeping a close eye on. And this concept that has emerged in, the, in recent years called One Health, which is not just about our health, but it's about the health of humans and animals and the environment and the fact that these things all work together and, and having a One Health approach to human health actually helps everyone. And I think there was, wasn't there a suggestion, remember those mink that were, had to be slaughtered in Scandinavia, that they may have actually caught it from a human? Wasn't there yeah. some suggestion about that? and it was mutating in, in the mink and they were, yes, slaughtering them to stop the chances that it could continue to mutate and then come back into humans again. That's, it, that's, one, that's one to, uh, to go back and listen through the, uh, the Health Report archives, Norman. Yeah, or Coronacast, can't remember which one we did it on. I think it was both. Well, I think that's all, t that's all we've got time for today. That's right. But of course, again, if you have questions, email us, healthreport at abc.net.au. And we'll see you next week. See you then.